and Tuesday and a new year. And um, let's start with some yeah. announcements. Right here. And today we have Dot. Wait a second. Tuesday. You have to have to wear some microphones. There's a microphone. And you have the microphone. And, 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 it's a panel to discuss questions such as what does good, healthy development for a community in the city look like? How are development decisions made? Who decides and why about tax savings? What opportunities are being missed or lost? And we have um, Amy, Amy Murray from the City Council, Alexis Kidzafer from Seven Hills Neighborhood House, Catherine Cogers, I guess, Director of Community Department of Planning, and Robbie Suggs, Economic Development and Community Outreach Director. And then we have Clarence from Wallen Hills Area Council, and it's being an, a narrated panel. But the real question is, what is the process and how are decisions made about giving huge amounts of land to Rhine guys to grow marijuana in one spring grove, or who makes the decisions? Uh, we'd love to know. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and uh, all of that. So anyway, this is at, at uh, 6 to 8 p.m. The program starts at 6.30 at the Fire Museum, right a uh, block away from City Hall. Do you, have, do, you have a, what, do you have an announcement that you can share with Peter? Or? I do. I'll give it to Peter. Okay. And then I have uh, also the Women's City Club national speaker is April 3rd. You should put it on your calendar at Memorial Hall. It's Helen Thorpe, who has um, written several books, but the one that, most, that we're most interested in this time is about immigration. And she was a school teacher in Denver and had three uh, young Mexican girls come into her classroom, and she kind of talks about their experience in assimilating into our country and that sort of thing. It should be a very interesting program, and I'll give all this information to Peter. Good. Get it to Peter. Does everybody know Peter? Peter, raise your hand. There he is, Peter, our newsletter person. He's really been putting some wonderful effort into the newsletter, even though he hasn't been here. I want you to know we've really had some uh, magnificent effort on Peter's behalf as uh, people have been taking over for him. Thank you for, to Ellen Beerhorse, where's Ellen? Oh, yeah, there she is. Silently, oh. yeah, oh. So, um, Wait a second. No, no, no. No, 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 no you're Good jumping in line there, Ellen. You're just jumping in line. Just wait. Wait, in line wait, okay. wait, wait, wait. Wait your line. Um, next Thursday, February 14th, a beautiful day, you know, to love one another. However, Onesco, who is the collaborative with all of the states that get their water from the Ohio River. There's an action at 10 o'clock at the Embassy Suites in Covington. It's extremely important that we have people there to voice the opposition to any relaxation of Ohio's standards for pollutants in the Ohio River. It's extremely important. Peter's got the information to put in the newsletter. It's at the Embassy Suites, Covington. We need people to be there. It's not a hearing, it's actual vote, 10 o'clock. And they basically need to see opposition to it because if Pennsylvania has high standards and Ohio lowers its standards, then once it gets down to Kentucky, we have more polluted water and more polluted water and more polluted water. So it's very important that we keep our Ohio River water as high standards as possible. And Ohio's always been good about that. But one of the things that are on the table is to release all standards for a state of Ohio. So it's extremely important. Repeat we know who's in favor of that. February 14th. February 14th. Okay. Ellen. Ellen, that's okay. So I'm Ellen, and I'm trying to get the Facebook, our Facebook presence rationalized. So here's the problem. I, I want to know who is it who's posting on Facebook, Greater Cincinnati Dems. We have two pages. Greater Cincinnati Democrats. Thank you, Alberta. She posts there and so forth. And then there's this other page, the mystery page. 
that apparently Liz Ping set up and then she went off to Thailand. So somebody is posting on that one. Is, are, is she or he in the room? No. Okay. <laughs> Down with Facebook. Down with Facebook. Down with Facebook. No, no. <laughs> Facebook is here to stay. Other announcement. Lori. Hi, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone the State of the Union is this evening, isn't it? And it doesn't. State of the Union is this evening, and it doesn't matter your political persuasion. You're all. On well, citizens, residents, we believe in learning about our country and what's being said about those who govern. And I want to let you know, last night I got the opportunity to attend, and I am a member, I admit, a meeting of the Federalist Society here in Northern Kentucky. It's a greater citizen than any chapter. And we had a presentation by two Sixth Circuit judges, Judge the Par and Judge Nabandian. There's no reason not to find out what these people think, regardless of what you think of them. Most of the Federalist Society videos are available for free on YouTube. Some fantastic footage from Washington that you've never traveled to see. So go have a look, see what's going on. Some of the people who talk are very interesting, if you don't agree. You mentioned the response to the State of the Union. It's going to be good. Oh, I am not familiar. I, yeah. Uh, there will be one, but I don't know who's Stacey, speaking. Stacy Abrams. Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, for those who uh, would rather not be looking at the president, the movie Dark Money will be shown at 8 o'clock in Chameleon on uh, the north side. Uh, that copy is a Hensley copy, and uh, it's a burnt thing. My brother Stanley and I are going to be showing that tonight at the Chameleon from 8 o'clock until 9.30. Where is the Chameleon? The Chameleon is 4114 Hamilton Avenue. And uh, it's at the end of a, another meeting that happens every Tuesday which, <laughs> with, with um, uh, Richard Asmus. Maybe you know him from the, from the campaign from, for um, Tab. But uh, the meeting continues, and uh, we're, we're, doing, we're showing the movie Dark Money tonight, if you don't want to see the president. Uh, other announcements? With that, I'm going to announce the Dark Money is happening at the Chameleon tonight. <laughs> From 8 o'clock till about 9.30. We have an announcement. Just a moment. Here we go. Uh, the registration for the Invest in Neighborhoods Neighborhood Summit uh, opened today, so visit investinneighborhoods.org, check out what uh, initial programs are available, and register to attend. It's March uh, 15th, I believe, and there's a Friday night dinner um, that'll be posted shortly, so we hope you can come and hear all the wonderful things that are happening in the Tri-State. Great, thank you. Write it up and we get it in the newsletter. He was really good about that. Any other announcements? Anybody else besides Sid? Okay, Sid is back there. He's awake this week. Um, he's our youngest Democrat. He's a two. Um, okay, and without further announcement, well, without further ado, let's introduce Eric. Wait a second. Hold it, wait. Marlena is going to introduce him. Marlena. They say to say your name three times. So Marlena. That's me. Marlena Brookfield. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Derek Bauman. Uh, he's here to talk to us about Vision Zero, which if you've been following the news lately, we've had a really huge problem with pedestrian and traffic safety, including the death of a West High student last year. This is a problem that we can stop. It can be prevented. So Derek here, who ran for city council in 2017, uh, you'll run again, right? 
Yes. Word on the street. Um, he's going to talk to us today about what Vision Zero is, what are all the particulars, and how can we keep the pressure on our elected officials to see that it gets implemented. So without further ado, take it away. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mark Lena, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, first of all, just uh, I, I think I see many familiar faces here and, and have been here and spoken to you all or with you all a number of times. Um, and it's certainly fantastic to be back, but just uh, a little more uh, by way of background. Uh, I did uh, run for city council in 2017, and I appreciate all of the support that I received in this. Um, in this room, and then you know, my campaign manager Eddie Davenport went on to uh, manage our uh, coordinated judicial campaign, and uh, I was here talking about that. Thank you all again for everything that you did in helping us to get our slate out, which was very successful. We got, I think, what five of our judicial candidates. Um, and we're on the way to taking over the uh, taking over the courthouse. So thank you all uh, for your on, yeah. ongoing support for all of that. Thank you. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Yourself. So as many as many of you know, I was a police officer for 26 years. Most of that time with the city of Mason, retiring in uh, 2016. And I can tell you from my personal experience. Uh, now, mostly working in Mason, we, you know, we weren't running from uh, shooting to shooting and, and these types of things. Um, but even in cities uh, that, that do have more types of gun violence and other things, one of the things that we're faced with the most, uh, and that oftentimes we don't think about in terms of a public safety issue, in terms of people dying, in terms of uh, a lot of people being seriously injured is car crashes. In the United States, we have uh, last year uh, nearly 40,000 people in the U.S. killed uh, by what I call car violence. It is violence. 40,000 deaths a year running neck and neck with gun violence in the U.S. But it's cars. And I mean, probably most of us, or if not all of us, drove here. Um, and, and so it's just something that we do and we don't realize that when we get behind the wheel that's probably one of the most um, dangerous things that any of us do on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's so much a part of our culture and a part of our lives here in the U.S. So we know public transportation isn't uh, supported and that's separate but really related to what we're talking about here today. Uh, and so we just, we just begin to accept this. And, and, and it's unfortunate. In Ohio, over a thousand. So that 40,000 across the U.S. in Ohio, we have over a thousand people killed in car crashes every year. Um, and that's just the deaths. Serious injuries um, and everything that comes out of that. The impact on families, uh, the impact on our health care system, uh, the cost of uh, public safety response. So in other words, when the police, the fire trucks, uh, all of that, the ambulances, all of these things roll out to a traffic crash. Um, if you start adding those dollars up, which again, the, the toll on human life and, and people's well-being is beyond that. Um, but even if we want to look at it economically, um, there's a massive cost there. And we know that in the city of Cincinnati, 70% of our operating budget goes to police and fire. A significant part of that is in response to the, the hundreds and thousands of traffic crashes that we had. Over. So throughout the, the campaign in 2017, because I saw it firsthand a lot of times, if you, I'm sure probably most folks here have been in the, uh, a, a crash or been impacted by one, hopefully not a serious one. Um, but in my career, most of the carnage, pun intended carnage, um, that I saw was from traffic crashes. And, and, you know, I, I won't get to go into the, to the gore, but it's pretty bad. Um, but then we get back in our cars and then we leave. And then you forget about it and you move on. Well, um, we have had different things, kind of not really coordinated, but different things that we've tried to do uh, here in the city of Cincinnati, uh, especially over the past decade, 10 or 15 years, because, you know, we saw in the 1950s and 1960s the car culture kind of took off. The focus became 
how can we raise people in and out of the city as quickly as possible? When we talk about the design of our streets, they're designed in such a way that it's not really about the people walking, about the people in the neighborhood, about pushing the baby stroller safely down to the corner coffee shop. And really, that's how our cities were designed to do that type of thing. Um, but if you think about, and I can give you a few examples, uh, we just you know spent 35 or 40 million dollars, whatever it was, on the um, uh, MLK interchange there at 71, and now MLK is something like 10 lanes wide, I can't even count. And if you actually go down there at the corner of Gilbert and MLK and watch the flashing walk signal, Grandma that lives in the, in, in the uh, uh, um, uh, low-income housing around the corner can barely get across the 10 lanes by the time the walk sign's flashing out. I mean, that's just one example. Um, again, Marlena mentioned in front of uh, uh, West High, Ferguson Road there. Numerous examples, Colerain Avenue, Montgomery Road through Pleasant Ridge. And we've seen the neighborhoods and the community councils um, in Northside, in Pleasant Ridge, um, and a number of neighborhoods throughout the city have been actively working to do um, essentially a redesign of our streets. Road diets, we call it, or traffic calming, if you've heard those terms. And in other words, if we can visualize this, it's taking different types of in, in, engineering infrastructure, whether it be bike lanes, um, whether it be what they call bump outs, which are at the corner to make it a, a less of a distance across uh, for pedestrians crossing, um, you know, different greeneries, different type of streetscapes, different things like that. And the concept behind that engineering is that if I am uh, driving in the road that I'm driving on, no matter what the speed limit sign says, you can put any arbitrary number on there. People tend to, through human nature, tend to drive to the design of the road. If the road looks like a highway and feels like a highway, you're going to tend to drive faster, right? Now, on the other hand, if the road tends to narrow and your kind of vision as you're driving tends to be narrow, think about going down like an alley or perhaps uh, a street that has cobblestones or some type of pavers and it's narrow like in an older neighborhood. Are you going to do 60 down there, naturally? Or regardless of what a speed limit sign says, might you drive at some speed slower than that to where you feel comfortable because there are these things visually constraining you. So these are the types of things that we have not um, really in Cincinnati. Other cities across the country, as we've suffered through in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, um, our traffic engineers being only a, a, a judging uh, a street on throughput and volume of cars because that's what it's all about. How can we get commuters out to pull rain uh, faster from the city and back and forth? That's been the concept and the design. So um, we've seen in Cincinnati again um, in 2010 we passed a bike plan where any road or any street in the city of Cincinnati that gets repaved is supposed to be looked at to say, okay, what type of, for example, bike infrastructure, bike lanes um, can we have? Our administration has ignored that since 2010. Basically ignored it. Council passes this, we have a 60-page uh, uh, bike plan, and then it just gets ignored, maybe, whatever they want. Um, and, and we've actually had to fight to keep our one bike lane that we have, the Central Parkway bike lane, which is kind of you know, snaggle tooth with the thing that was not maintained. Um, and that's it, that's our one. And you go to other cities and, and these things are happening. Um, that's just one example. We've had, uh, for example, in my neighborhood over the Rhine, we've been working on for six years now, the Liberty Street Road Diet. If you've ever driven down Liberty Street, it's a canyon. And it basically uh, is an asphalt canyon that, that really serves to divide the northern and southern parts um, of, of over the Rhine. And, you know, that was in the 50s. It was a narrow street, just like all the rest of the narrow streets down there. And they took buildings from the south side, widened it to make this connector from 71 to 75 because it's all about the cars, right? Um, six years we've been working on this plan. Our DOTE in the, in the city of Cincinnati drags their feet 
Um, we've gone through iterations, community meetings, and then they come back and we've got to study it and we're going to do something else. It's because they, the, the institutional stasis is the status quo of we don't want to slow a car down. <clears throat> Ultimately. God forbid. God forbid. Uh, and in the meantime, you try to cross the street and it's flat. <laughs> the thing's flashing, you can't barely get across there by the time it's already flipping over and it's going green and everybody's off like a shot. Um, Pleasant Ridge has had a plan, been working on a plan for eons now for Montgomery Road, same type of thing. Um, now, because of all of this kind of bottom up grassroots, how a lot of things tend to change around here, if they do, because we've been lacking leadership from the top, in my view, um, you know, it's because neighborhoods have demanded this. And unfortunately, in these types of things, it takes a crisis a lot of times to really bring it to a head. And so we saw that in Northside, uh, where the, the neighborhood of Northside and, and under the community council, they have a, like a traffic advisory committee, I forget the exact name, working on these issues. DOTE uh, in the administration has, has fought them on it. But finally, and it took a, a renowned business owner uh, in the neighborhood getting killed on Hamilton Avenue, and now we get some action, and it's a traction <coughs> finally. So part of the plan there was um, in the morning and the evening rush hours when we have the two lanes, because we're to remember throughput, we're trying to move cars out to the suburbs as quickly as possible. Um, now we're doing 24-hour parking. It started out as kind of a pilot program, um, and it worked well. Now it's here to stay because, again, by allowing the parking uh, along the side, that kind of narrows the street, tends to slow the speeds down, um, and so naturally these types of things are happening. So what we're doing, and then after West High, let me just back up one more thing um, because I need to touch on this, very important, enforcement. From the enforcement perspective, a lot of folks say, well, really what we need is is we need more cops out there we need uh, cops writing tickets um, for a number of reasons CPD citations have gone down um, over time um, but I can tell you on that when it comes to enforcement we have 3100 lane miles of street in the city of Cincinnati 3100 lane miles so if you figure uh, street has at least two lanes maybe more there's actually maybe what it's round numbers 1200 miles of streets in cincinnati well we have a thousand cincinnati police officers so if we put every police officer on duty 24 hours a day there would be one every 1.2 miles so really how effective is that from my experience we would have a problem uh, in the city of mason there'd be a, cr a couple of crashes in a neighborhood or somebody important had something happen out in front of their house and so they send the police out there for two weeks to do some kind of a traffic blitz and we come back and we've got a spreadsheet full of a bunch of numbers and then the question is and then you leave and go on about your business because you can't keep doing that forever um you know what was really impacted in the long term so now you're starting to see some stuff that was actually on the news uh and council member landsman is kind of leading the effort um, talking about automating this enforcement a little bit it gets into traffic cameras and a whole other thing and that's a, a hot button issue but how do we tie all of this together and really make an impact because somebody says well we need more enforcement somebody says well if you design the streets better somebody else says well what we need to do is educate the public because you know we took um, driver's ed out of the schools and so now who knows what anybody if they learn anything in driver's ed we don't even know um, so there's this education, so, so three E's, you'll hear PG talk about the three E's, um, and there's a few more, but, but those are three of the big ones. How we're engineering our streets. Are they engineer just for the cars, or are we engineering for the people? People walking, pushing the stroller, on the bike, on a scooter these days, on a, a, a motorized wheelchair, whatever it may be. This concept that there is equity in our streets, it's not just about the cars. A lot of times don't live in the neighborhood or maybe even in your city they're just passing through so why are we so concerned about them so engineering then there's the enforcement um, there has to be some but we know through the data it shows us that just the cop out there writing the ticket not as super manpower intensive we don't have enough manpower from that, from that. so how can we look at and what have other cities done um, that's been effective in this regard and then the educational piece and some other things that brings us to Vision Zero, which is really what I'm here to talk about today. Um, you might have hopefully 
started to hear about this, um, but we're going to hear more. Vision Zero started actually in uh, Europe, and it's this concept um, that's now being adopted across the United States by cities, uh, even entire states, that it takes a holistic, comprehensive approach um, that when you have such a problem as 40,000 people killed and hundreds of thousands injured every single year, that it's not just any one of those things. If we're really going to make a dent in these numbers, it's going to take all of that. And it could be different uh, for different communities, depending on um, the nature of your street design already. Um, but it's this concept that we're going to bring everybody to the table and address this in a comprehensive way. And if, if you read any of the articles, um, and really this came come to light, and, and Marlena knows quite well, um, we had 13 CPS kids hit in this school year in the first semester between September and December. And that's really even people that are against it. Now, how can you be against traffic safety? We got kids dying in the street. So, unfortunately, it's taken this to really bring it to the forefront. But I still watch and see um, because it's really easy to talk in terms of slogans and hashtags, right? Vision Zero, we adopted, okay? We said we did it. What do we actually do? there's going to come the implementation. So uh, a number of cities, and I used an example, um, I brought, and I didn't print it out because it's a lot of stuff, um, but Philadelphia in 2017 adopted this. And so let me give you a little idea of what uh, Philadelphia, because we're not trying to invent the wheel here. Other places are doing this successful. Um, they're talking about equity, identifying equitable solutions um, developed on behalf of all Philadelphians. What does that mean? It's really about this concept that there's equity in the streets. It's not just about the cars. It's about transit users, people on bikes. And I don't like to say cyclists or pedestrians. Um, sometimes it's easy to say that, but kind of dehumanizes. I mean, it's people on bicycles. You're not hitting a pedestrian here. You're hitting a person in a car. Um, so let's talk about car violence and, and talk about people. Uh, evaluation, because we're going to implement things and we want to know if there's actual outcomes, if it's successful or not, um, and then, you know, if we need to make any changes, we can adapt and do that. Uh, engineering, engineering our streets to reduce crashes, we talked about that, education, um, and uh, enforcement. So all of these types of things, and it brings all the stakeholders to the table. So for example, if we had uh, a Vision Zero task force here. Uh, in the city of Cincinnati or wherever you live, you would want to have your DOTE uh, representative. You would want to have your police department representative. You would want to have the school board representative. They play a large role in this as well. And a matter of fact, I think you'll see our CPS school board lead on this because they're part of our head in this city in a lot of ways. Um, and you're going to have somebody that's involved with public relations, um, somebody that's involved with the media, a lot of this is about, about getting the message out. Here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it. Um, so you're gonna have that, and that comes into the education um, part of it. Uh, Philadelphia here is actually talking about their fleet operations uh, because they have hundreds of vehicles in Philadelphia, so what can we do? Do, do our big trucks need backup cameras? Um, different things like that. So you're gonna have fleet operations involved for, the, for whatever the government entity is itself. But it's this concept that it's not one of those things. And, and, and if you watch some of the articles as they come up in, in the social media posts on it in the comments, that, that's how it goes. Wow, well, we need more. Well, we need the streets design. It's all of the above. The other thing that I um, urge us to do as we look at this is to not preemptively take options off the table. Um, and, and I've been uh, having some pushback with some folks on that because somebody right off the bat says, because they're thinking in their mind, I drive on that road, I don't want my commute to slow down. So now if we're doing something that's constricting the road and maybe the car's got to find a different way or it's going to take them an extra two light cycles, now that's impacting me. So I don't want to talk about those road diets and that kind of stuff. We can talk about more cops because I like cops. Okay, well then let's talk about that. And you got somebody saying, well, you know, I, I got this ticket one time um, and I was driving through and it, the thing took my picture and it sent a ticket to some place and I didn't really like that. And so now we don't want to talk about that anymore. So we're going to take that off the table. Um, 
we don't know what the data shows. Maybe there's some you know positive correlations there that if we're automating that enforcement, um, you know, it may have a wider impact than the one cop for every 1.2 miles. But now I think about the time that I got a ticket and I didn't like getting that ticket in the mail. So now we're taking that off the table. Um, and then somebody else says, well, you know, and it's neither one of those two things, but I don't think we should talk about that because if somebody gets run down, we're going to blame the victim and they should have looked both ways before they cross the street. So the hell with all of um, I, I, I urge you, keep an open mind on this stuff. And some of it is maybe a little kind of antithetical or we don't necessarily think that that could be it or we have our notions of what it might be, but let's look at the data. Let's look at what other places have done successfully. And let's keep in mind that in the city of Cincinnati in 2018, we had 400 people that were victims of car violence. That's just the people walking. That's not the victims that were in other cars or anything else, pedestrians, people walking, 400, in the city of Cincinnati alone. So, you know what, the reality is, uh, if I'm driving down the street and I get sent a ticket at home because I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing, I mean, if overall this is going to, we can impact these numbers, I think we at least need to consider it and not just say no before we even get started. Because everybody can say no to something and then we're right back to folks start. <coughs> um, so, right now, where we stand in terms of the city, we have some dollars now flowing to some of these things. Um, it's better than nothing, roughly a million dollars after the, the last West High incident, and I might add a citizen-led press conference um, that uh, I was at, that Marlena was at, uh, and you look around and where is everybody at? It's the community there, um, PG was there, um, some others are leading on this, but why does it always happen? Why does it always have to happen? But, uh, we should have a little more leadership from the top, but we're forcing their hand. And now it's hard to say no to. So we've got a million dollars, um, but there's a lot of intersections. There's a lot of streets in this city. Um, and in my view, for us to really address this issue in a holistic way, we need to adopt Vision Zero um, and then talking, talk about um, actually implementing it. So it's not just a slogan. They say they did it um, because we know we've got a bike plan sitting up on the shelf uh, since 2010. And so we adopt this stuff, and council says, hey, we adopted it. The charter says administration's supposed to do it. And then they do something else. And then there's influence from the side, from the mayor's office. So I'm hopeful um, because of, unfortunately, it's taken all of this crisis. And heaven forbid, uh, another kid is hit today, tomorrow, or the next day. Um, I'm not going away. I'm going to be on about this. And I hope the rest of you are, too. Uh, but the way forward, I submit to you, is Vision Zero. Uh, it's something new here in Cincinnati, and, and so we need to uh, talk about it. We need to learn more uh, about it, but ultimately it's about, and, and our vision is zero. Zero fatal crashes, zero serious injury crashes is the goal. Let's put a timeline on that and then look at all the, the three E's and other different ways that typically operate in their own independent silos. <laughs> Let's all come together around the table and look at what we can do, um, our department or our organization, uh, to impact this in a real way. Consider the data, another E, evaluate, uh, and make adjustments from there. Uh, but we're going to have to have some real institutional buy-in um, because the, the reality is that's not what our DOTE and our administration and our just general mindset in Cincinnati is used to doing. Um, so it's going to take some, some change and adaptation, um, but yeah, I don't think what we're doing right now is, is very successful. Uh, and so there's dead people who show that. And so that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, Council Member Landsman has been uh, leading on this issue. And so um, right now there is a motion out there uh, in City Council has not been adopted yet. Um, it's in, we've kind of got a little competing interest because we've got Smitherman's uh, Law and Safety Committee uh, and then we've got uh, uh, Landsman's, I think I forget it's a big title, Major Projects and Transportation uh, Committee. So I, I'm not sure what direction it's going to go yet. I'd like to see it in Greg's committee. Um, but it actually uses the term Vision Zero. And to the mayor's credit, I get mayor a hard time. 
but he actually mentioned, it was kind of at the end and under his breath a little bit, but he mentioned Vision Zero at the press conference that he held out at West High. Um, and of course, PG's office has worked with Duke Energy and they're going around and, and replacing the LED lights. When we had our, our press conference out at West High School, it was dark out there. And now, because it was a big deal, right? So there's cops out and the lights are on and waving traffic and all of this stuff. And there's a big press conference, TV lights going. And you're still here, am I right? You're still here in the car, the, week, the tires screeching. Because now that's, they're used to racing through and now stuff's being slowed down and there's craziness going on. Um, so we need to address this in a holistic way. Vision Zero is the way forward. Um, and I can give you, again, there's a ton of material out there, so I don't want to uh, kill a bunch of trees. And, and um, bring a bunch of stuff in here. But I'll, for the newsletter or the follow-up, I will uh, give you a couple resources in terms of the websites and, and things like that. Um, of course, just you can Google that. And come up with a lot of things. So um, with that, I will kind of uh, maybe bring it to a close and take some uh, take some questions. Yes. Who's got the mic? <laughs> What, what is the role of the Department of Transportation and how is the head of that appointed or just explain it? Sure. So uh, for the city of Cincinnati, we actually have a new uh, head of DOTE, Joe Vogel, who uh, was employed by the city for a, a long time. And I know Joe, I'm optimistic about his mindset that he has towards these types of things. Um, Joe left to go to work for the Ohio Department of Transportation for a while, and then Parsons Brinkerhoff, which is like an engineering consulting firm, uh, and he was actually head of Cincinnati office at Parsons Brinkerhoff, and they changed their name or something else, WS, I'm not sure what it stands for, but now Joe's back, Joe's a good guy. Um, the challenge is, is even at, at, at the boss of DOTE, you've got traffic engineers and numerous employees and, and an or, a large organization that has, it's like turning a battleship. It's, you know, it's got its kind of way of doing things. And even if the top down wants the cogs in the wheel, if they don't really want to do something different, can, you know, drag their feet in certain ways. Um, so this is going to take a top down, you know, change in the way we think about things. And specifically for DOT is one of the biggest. It's this whole notion of road diets, traffic calming, bike lanes, pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and you travel, you go places, you see how they do it. Oh, the crosswalk's not just two white lines. It's a, a, a textured surface. It's super bright paint. It's um, a bus lane. So we're working on a pilot program for our first ever bus lane on, on, on Main Street downtown. It's all, and it's like, well, you know, how many, wait, you're taking, that's for the bus, but what about the cars? You know, somebody's always like, what about the cars? Sorry. Um, but it's it's going to take a different mindset um, and a way, of, uh, uh, just a change in way of how we think about our streets. And really, when you think about it, going back to the way our cities were designed in the 1800s, with tr public transportation. Look at the old pictures, right? There's people in top hats and whatnot. And they're out walking everywhere in the streets because that was before jaywalking was a thing. That was an invention of the American Automobile Association that we're going to criminalize people in the streets to get the people out of the way so the cars can go like this. That's what it was. And so we're talking about equity, another E, going back to this notion that our streets are shared by the people. And so we'll have some people in cars, we'll have some people in buses, and maybe somebody, uh, a few people on the streetcar, hopefully a lot, and we're going to have people on bikes and people pushing baby strollers, and everybody can use the streets in a, in a safe way, not worry about getting run down. Um, so that's, DOT has a huge role to play in all of this, especially in Cincinnati, where we're still in that old mindset of cars 100 miles what's the, But what's their function? Well, the, the function is the, literally the design of the streets. So we have neighborhoods like Pleasant Ridge and North Side and over the Rhine saying, we have these streets that are like this, and we want them to be designed in more of a cohesive fashion so I'm comfortable walking. And then we've got DOTE saying, yeah, but our goal is to have 23,000 cars per hour be able to go through there. And what you're talking about is going to cut that to 17.5 and we might have traffic back up. So their role is to say that that's okay. 
and then we can design the streets in this way. Um, and so you even see, you know, competing factions of engineers almost, and it goes back to your mindset. Um, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but no pun intended on that. Um, but we've actually had commentary back when uh, the neighborhoods are working on these things and they have a community meeting. Somebody from DOT comes out and says, you know what, actually I live in Rain. I'm trying to go home at five o'clock. And that's your, because they don't want their impact, their commute, these types of things. So it's getting away from this whole notion. And I'm sorry if that means that somebody's been here for a really long time, if they can't get with the program, then maybe they can do something else. Over here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, hey, Derek. Um, and so I'm, first off, on behalf of my family, my community, our schools, um, our city, thank you for doing what you do and out there champion for all of us. Um, I just have a, a very simple question. I think as more people start hearing about Vision Zero and uh, the opportunities that that could present for safety and equity, is there a Facebook group or is there an opportunity for people to um, be engaged uh, in a higher level and maybe to put out call of actions to get people to come to your events or press conferences or City Hall at the right time when needed? Uh, the answer to, first of all, thank you. I appreciate that, it's very kind. Um, the answer to your question is no. Uh, we This has kind of been for a while now, me talking about it, and then now we're kind of like building a groundswell. There's really no infrastructure yet. Um, I'm hoping that for a change, maybe we have some leadership from the top, um, and it doesn't always have to be us because, you know, we're, I'm, we're talking about gun safety. We're talking about we're talking about public transportation, and you know we have only so much bandwidth as volunteers. But um, I think that would be a great idea to have a more of a social media presence. Specific part of the reason why I'm here is to help you know start to spread the spread the word because really it's unfortunate, but this is really just started to gain significant traction subsequent to all these kids getting hit this fall. Back here. Yes. You brought up um, public transportation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you see the role of public transportation? I've lived in other countries, and um, getting traffic out of the city is not just a matter of sending gazillion cars. It's also changing people's um, uh, way of you know, way of doing things. So um, I think it's. Most of you probably know about me. Uh, public transportation is one of my big issues. It plays a huge role here. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the challenges that we have uh, is, you know, be a separate luncheon, probably talking about SORTA and, and whatever happens with the levy coming up for that. Um, but in the big picture, the state of Ohio, eighth most populous state, from the state level funds public transportation 43rd per capita in the nation. Huge problem. I've been up to Columbus and testified around budget time in terms of uh, the state needs to give us more funding for public transportation. We're up there talking, we know how our gerrymandered, how that is, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're up there talking to these guys that they drive. Why do you think we're making three lanes all the way from Cincinnati to Cleveland on I-71? Because mm -hmm. our legislators drive it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, they do. Uh, so. Knowing my audience and knowing my police background and also having a business degree and an MBA, I go up there and argue about, well, um, we need to fund this because, um, first of all, it's an economic issue in terms of we know that young people today don't want to drive as much, so if we want to attract them and the knowledge industries that employ them, like other cities do, we need to, uh, because if you just go up there and talk public transit, you're a communist and they don't want to hear it, right? So you got to know your audience, and how do you sell a message to them? So we talk about economics and how that works. Um, and then the second thing I talk about is public safety. They don't think about it in those terms. It's like an acceptable level of casualties because it's cars, um, and so it doesn't matter that we have a thou over a thousand dead. So you go up there, and then it's like, well, how much traction are you getting with that? But to me, that's the message, especially if you're talking about the gerrymandered suburban, exurban, and rural Republicans that are in control up there. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, we know Governor Kasich took away the money when, when he came in in 2010, not only for the uptown streetcar, but the 3C rail that would have went, you know, we would have had an Amtrak service from here to Columbus to Cleveland. Well, what if um, 
uh, heaven forbid anybody knows of somebody that was killed on I-71 over the last eight years, that if they would have been able uh, to easily go and take the train, very safe way of travel, mm -hmm. but for that person wouldn't have died. And w was that ever part of the discussion? No, but I submit that it probably should be. Um, and so if, we, if, if folks won't accept this just on its face, that public transportation has some value, then how can we sell it? you know, in a way that, that may register or make sense. I talk about this public safety angle to it, we talk about the economic angle to it, you know, how much traction we get, um, more than if we didn't talk about it. So, the, the answer to your question is yes, it plays a huge role. If we had more, if I wouldn't have, you know, if I had like super quick, reliable public transportation to get here, yeah, I would have had to drive and then I would have been in a crash. So, yes. Actually, I, I had a question, but I'll bring the mic back here now. Um, one of them was, speaking of Europe, I lived in, I've lived in a lot of different countries and worked in a lot of different countries in Europe, and one thing that I know that if you attempt to run a red light in Europe, a little flash goes off, and the next thing you know, there's a picture of you running the red light, arrives in the mail with a ticket, and the second time the flash goes off, you, you don't do it a third time. And people don't run red lights. And I, when I was a kid, a yellow light meant slow down, and a red light meant stay there. No, you, yellow means go like hell. I'm not sure. Why. Yellow, means, <laughs> yellow means go like hell, and red means how far do I have to go to get through that one too? You know. And it's amazing how insensitive people are here. And I think don't give up on intersection cameras. You know, it's not it's not really a privacy question. If you're out in public, you're in public. If a cop could see you drive through an intersection, so can a so can a camera, you know. And the other the other question I have is, it's, that wasn't a question, but the other question is, years ago I served, I still serve on the Green Umbrella Transportation Committee, and we had CPS come and talk to us a lot of times about this program they wanted to do, where school buses would stop a mile from school, and then the kids would walk the rest of the way to get the exercise that they're not they're not getting, which. To me, seemed insane, no but I was one of the only people who spoke against it. Has that been implemented? And if it has, is that part of why kids are getting hit by cars? So, um, Marlena would probably know more about this, but generally speaking, CPS is only responsible. Um, they're not responsible for busing high school kids. And so, what we see around the high school is there are, and that's what we saw at West High Dater. Um, that there are more kids on a very busy street, and that's not a good combination. Um, a very busy street with high speeds. Um, so, I don't think that was implemented, um, but the public transportation uh, angle and the schools play a very important role. Um, Craig, did you, you have a specific answer to that? Yeah, I'll just say, um, first off, that was part of the Allegiance Project, and it was not implemented. Um, the second is, the state of Ohio does not require busing for high school students. However, CPS goes above and beyond, and they do bus their students through a metro contract, which is a very sizable contract. Yep. And um, as far as yellow busing for the elementaries and for the middle schools, they also go above what the state mandate is, and they bus at 1.25. As Derek and Marlena have been out championing, one of the biggest changes for the busing of all our students is now to make sure that they're dropping them off on the side of the street where the school is located so they don't have to cross the street. Um, and that's one initial change <clears throat> along with the others you mentioned. And we actually had one of our victims, Gabby Rodriguez, age 13, was actually hit after she was getting off the bus. Is that correct? The metro bus? Um, so there are things that we can do in that regard. And that's why it's important to have everybody at the table. Um, and talking about all, and we're not running in separate directions. The, the other thing about Europeans is they seem to be much better educated about how to drive, you know, about the rules of the road and the... Well, you know, we feel, especially when, and there's a lot of data out there on the type of vehicle, um, SUVs are much more deadly and SUVs are more and more popular these days. And if you think about it, a small, lower kind of car with a wedge front, if it does hit a person, the person tends to like deflect and go up and over. Injured, maybe not dead, depending on the speed. SUVs, you think to hit a person's like a bug hitting the front. 
Uh, so there's actually data out there about how that's more dense. So there's all of these things, and then we feel invincible because when you talk about five stars safety crash ratings, that's for the occupants. That's not for who it's hitting. So that's the, the whole marketing behind that, and you're right in your tank, and you're safe. It doesn't matter what you run over, because you're in a Hummer, you're good. Uh, so it's just getting away from that notion. Real quick on the cameras, real quick on the cameras, because we're hearing more about that. Uh, so there was a charter amendment passed years ago. Um, it says basically any type of automated enforcement like that has to go to the voters first. It doesn't say we can't do it. Um, so there are certain things that have been found constitutional, unconstitutional. It seems to be a little more palatable to folks if it's actually an officer running it. Um, so there's a way that it's not just a camera up here, it's a handheld type of thing, which WCPO in their article that they did the other day used that, but then went on to talk about other cameras at the mounted, which is not really what's being proposed, at least by Councilmember Landsman now, be a handheld type of thing, um, has been useful and palatable elsewhere. Um, and then any revenue that comes out of that, it's not just the slush fund for whatever, it's then directed back to the engineering that we don't have money for, for the road diets and other things. And so then you engineer the streets better, and then now we're talking about all these comprehensive things. But still, I say we should be doing vision zero first. Everybody sit down, figure out the best practices, and then let's have a cohesive plan and not a bunch of hodgepodge. One is just a comment. Yesterday on the public radio station, they talked about public transportation with David Mann, and I believe it was the mayor from Dayton. And one of the things that they one of the things they brought up is that even with the public transportation that is trying to expand, is and is it me the way I'm holding it? I don't know. Um, is the stand here as it could be that's not proceeding. This. Okay. And one of the problems they brought up is that you have the city of San Francisco, uh, city of Cincinnati, and you, let's say the bus route, and they could do so much, but then to bring it over to Green Township, then you have the other side of the issue of dealing with them, and and it is a big issue. You're trying to get more cars off the street, especially for people at work. I mean, and this is something that I think the public transportation should be looked at. You know, and there's so many places that it has worked so well, and I don't know, understand why the city is not willing to do something like that. Um, yes. <laughs> we need more on public transportation. Uh, to touch on one point, you mentioned Green Township. There's absolutely no reason why Hamilton County uh, and our commissioners can't adopt this as well. Haven't approached them yet. It's been kind of a city issue because that's mostly where it's been focused, unfortunately, with our um, the injuries and the newsworthy stuff that we've had. But we just had a, a police officer hit and kill uh, a few weeks ago, right? Um, and so there's absolutely no reason why Hamilton County can't be a Vision Zero County and for areas where it's stuff's over the border or, or individual, you know, Norwood, other places can adopt this and in their own way. Um, uh, uh, play a role in it, but public transportation is certainly um, certainly plays a role here. Anything else? And I we're maybe almost out of time. Um, thank you for coming and um, teaching us about Vision Zero. Um, how can we help you and help our community implement Vision Zero or Spark? Um, the immediate thing that we that I would suggest right now is uh, sending some emails to all of council and the mayor and the city manager um, saying that we support um, the adoption of Vision Zero and its implementation. Um, because to me, that's where the real rubber hits the road. It's real easy for council to pass a motion. It only takes five votes if there's no veto. Um, and they do that, and then what happens? You know, we say we did it, and then we go on doing what we were doing before. Um, it's going to take some real work and implementation and holding people accountable and holding their feet to the fire that they can't just nod and say yes and pat us on our heads and send us on our way. Um, and really, every time that there's some unfortunate newsworthy crash is a good opportunity to remind them, what are you actually doing? Or are you just putting band-aids on it saying you did something and try to make us feel better? And now we've got somebody else here bleeding out in the street. Um, so, to answer your question for now, thank you, Crystal, for everything uh, that you're, you do. You're a great advocate as well. Um, right now, I would say um, letting the city manager um, 
DOTE, Director Vogel, uh, Council, the Mayor, know that we want to be Vision Zero, and not only do we want to uh, adopt it, we want it implemented fully in a holistic and comprehensive way. You mentioned uh, other states. I spent time in California. I love that the pedestrian has a right of way over everything else. I mean, if they, even they, the middle of a highway, they walk at you damn well have to stop. Another thing, my uh, sister-in-law's in Connecticut, she said they have terrific free educational programs for safety for older drivers. And she was amazed the kinds of things, you know, she's been driving 50 years, uh, the kind of things she was learning from this special free course. Is that something how these things tend to happen on the coasts? I'm not sure why that is, but um, yeah, and, and, and that education is a big part of it. It's, it's a change in mindset, um, not only for the powers that be uh, in government, but people in and all of us. Uh, you know, we're on our phones these days, you know, maybe high on heroin, texting, fate, you know, who knows, eating a burrito, changing the radio say all of it. We need to focus, slow down, focus, think about the people, and the people. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I would like to bring up a point about trying to prevent a major possibility of traffic accidents and fatalities occurring where new development is going on. For the last two years, I have been involved in trying to prevent a developer from bringing in a major development in Hyde Park, and it traffics now area already where a police officer already was hit, and a woman was hit, and a child. I can already think of four accidents I'm racking up right now. And I was on the committee to spearhead preventing this from going ahead, this massive development, which was in a major traffic now. And I was repeatedly told, and I had contact with every single city council member, everybody, and I was repeatedly told, Pam, traffic safety, that's not a sexy issue. That was ex the exact words. That is not a sexy issue. And it was the most important issue for me. I have other concerns for why, about why that was going in and would be a problem. But my major concern was that it wasn't a question of when, but it was just a question of how many people were going to die. Because by the way, this construction was dead center, one foot in front of where high school kids had to get on the bus. Dead center, right there. That's where, where, where the in and out, ingress and egress of this um, parking garage would be. Now this is what you're talking about, metro buses delivering kids, I think that that has to be a major part of how we handle and respond to development that one comes into our area. Because once they're there, you've got this traffic death potential, but you can fight against that before it comes in. And I guess I'd like tips from you about how to do that. Right. So so that's, so that's a, a, a great point that you bring up. Uh, I would just kind of like along those lines, offer, offer a couple of suggestions. One is, there's kind of a, a, this discussion now about community benefit agreements, yes. uh, or that if we're gonna give uh, abatements and other things um, to developers, that they have to in some way be responsible to the neighborhood in, in terms of what we want that to look like, we, what do we want it to be, what do we want it to do. So one of the things that we can do as part of that, not that we're trying to stop the development or anything else, but to think in terms of what's the built environment like around that, what does it look like? So there could be, oh, you know what? It's not just about having 50 car parking garage. It's about there could be bike parking. There could be some different things incorporated into the design of that in the street that talks about some of these things. It's not just about the cars. Um, you know, so that's one kind of concept to keep in mind. Um, as these things come through community councils and want other approvals, or that those are some of the things that we can um, ask for uh, in that regard. And so one of the things that council's done is eliminated parking minimums um, for some of the new developments downtown, which if that means then folks have less need to park and they take bikes and public transit more, then that kind of feeds into the whole big picture there. So that's one way that we can approach that. I'd like to remind everybody, at the very beginning of the meeting, Doc came up and told us about this Women's City Club on February 26th from 6 to 8 down at the Fire Museum. Who wins, who loses, finding balance in neighborhood development. 
This is exactly one of those topics that we need to be talking about here. It's a piece because it's about we the people, not otherwise. Okay? So just remember, this will be in the newsletter. It's very important. February 26th, Fire Museum. This is just first in a series of three. Let's hear it for Eric Bowman. You have done it again, people. You've been a very responsive, responsible set of adults. Play in Parenthood next week. I was just about to announce it. We have, I have to tell you, you know, when I think about uh, the president going on camera, I think of Pence. And every time I look at Pence, I'm thinking, more dollars for Planned Parenthood. You, you, you guys don't get it, do you? Yeah, you know his name. And you give you give to Planned Parenthood and Pence his name because it's so outrageous right now. So I, 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 every time I see Pence, I think, Planned Parenthood, yay, go for it. I just want you to know. And then we have Green Umbrella and then Refugees. We have a really good program for you in the next few months. And uh, please stay with us because we've got a lot of good things going on. So thank you for coming. Thank you for your good questions. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for, for enjoying our day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.